It's a real honor to welcome you to this installment of the Communities in Conversation series, Whitman at 200, which has been organized not only in honor of the 200th anniversary of the poet Walt Whitman's birth, but also the 50th anniversary of the Stonewall Press, which, I'm sorry, um, which began the American social movement for the LGBTQIA plus rights. Before I introduce our guests, there are several folks I need to thank. First, our sponsors, the Departments of History, English, Art and Art History, Gender and Sexuality Studies, Search, Urban Studies, the Club Hanson Gallery, and Out Memphis. Special thanks for planning tonight's program goes to Amy Benson, Assistant Professor of Creative Writing in the English Department, and Jonathan Judakin, the Spencer Wilson Chair in Humanities and Professor of History. An extra special thanks to Jackie Baker in history and Lori Yearwood in English, whose work made those plans a reality. In Song of Myself, Walt Whitman famously declared, I contain multitudes. And I love how the book Live Oak with Moss, with its diverse mediums and voices, embodies this paradox of a unified multiplicity. Its creators, Brian Selznick and Karen Carboner, are with us tonight, headlining a program that also promises to contain multitudes. And I mean that in the very best way. Brian Selznick is a New York Times best-selling author and winner of the Randolph Caldecott Medal, which annually recognizes the most distinguished American picture books for children. You will undoubtedly recognize some of his work, which includes Wonderstruck, the invention of Hugo Cabre, which served as the basis for Martin Scorsese's film Hugo, and more recently, the thing that makes me a fan girl, the new illustrated covers for the 20th anniversary series of Harry Potter. Tonight, Mr. Selznick will read to us from Whitman's poetry cycle, Live Oak with Moss, while we are treated to his glorious illustrations of Whitman's work. Accompanying him will be our own John Bass, assistant professor in the music department and director of the Mike Herb Institute for Music. Afterward, Dr. Karen Carboner will share with us some scholarly context about Whitman and the writing of these poems. Dr. Carboner <laughs> teaches at New York University, and she notes on her faculty page that she is delighted to live in the place that inspires her the most, New York City, which was also Whitman's hometown and inspiration. She's published widely on Whitman's life and work, including editing The Leaves of Grass, First and Deathbed Editions for Barnes and Noble Classics, a recognized public scholar, she has been featured in radio, television, and online programs. In May of this year, she contributed an essay to CNN entitled, Walt Whitman's America Was a Mess, So Was Ours. She is president of the Walt Whitman Initiative and is spearheading the campaign to grant landmark status to Whitman's only standing residence in New York City. Once Dr. Carboner is finished, Joel Parsons, Director of Club Hanson Gallery and Chair of Rhodes Gender and Sexuality <coughs> Studies Program, will join our presenters on stage to lead a question and answer session. Now, without further ado, please join me in welcoming Brian Selznick to the stage. so much. I'm so thrilled to be here at Rhodes. <coughs> In 2004, I befriended the legendary children's book author and illustrator Maurice Sendak, and we got to know each other through a series of late night phone calls. I had just finished a children's book about Walt Whitman, and by coincidence, Maurice was reading Leaves of Grass for the first time. During one of our conversations, he learned from his friend, the scholar Herschel Parker. In the 1850s, Whitman had written a cycle of 12 poems called Live Oak with Moss, which Maurice described as a love story between two men who eventually part. Whitman never published the cycle. Instead, he cut them up, rearranged them, and hid them in the calamus cluster of poems in the 1860 edition of Leaves of Grass. They remained completely unknown for a hundred years. 
years until they were discovered and extracted in the 1950s by bibliographer Fredson Bowers.
I saw in Louisiana a live oak grove. All alone stood it, and the moss hung down from the branches. Without any companion, it grew there, glistening out with joyous leaves of dark green. And its look, rude, unbending, lusty, made me think of myself. But I wondered how it could utter joyous leaves standing alone there without its friend, its lover, for I knew I could not. And I plucked a twig with a certain number of leaves upon it, and twined around it a little moss, and brought it away, and I have placed it in sight in my room. It is not needed to remind me as of my friends, for I believe lately I think of little else than of them. Yet it remains to me a curious token. I write these pieces and name them after it. For all that, and though the live oak listens there in Louisiana, Solitary in a wide, flat space, uttering joyous leaves all its life, without a friend, a lover near, I know very well I could not. O oh, you, whom I often and silently come where you are, that I may be with you, as I walk by your side, or sit near, or remain in the same room with you. Little you know the subtle electric fire that for your sake is playing within me. To the young man, many things to absorb, to engraft, to develop, I teach that he may be my elev. But if through him rolls not the blood of divine friendship, hot and red, if he be not silently selected by lovers, and do not silently select lovers of what use were it for him to seek to become a length of mine.
Crash. John Bass, everybody. Now I'd like to introduce Karen Carpenter. heartfelt thanks to you for welcoming Brian and Walt and me uh, to Memphis. I, I think we, we, our hearts are full. Um, I, I want to also uh, say a special thank you to Amy Benson, a dear friend who, who made this entire day. Walt Whitman, known worldwide as America's poet, poet of democracy, the father of free verse, the good great poet, you've heard these things before. You've probably read and maybe even recited O Captain, My Captain, his well-known ode to Abraham Lincoln. You may have studied Song of Myself, his great personal epic, and the first real presentation of American character. And you may even have heard Whitman himself recite his poem, America, to sell Levi's jeans recently. <laughs> As we celebrate Whitman's 200th birthday and the 50th anniversary of the Stonewall Riots in New York this year, it is time to recognize that America's poet is also America's first queer spokesperson and activist. And these 12 poems, known as Live Oak with Moss, were Whitman's first sustained attempt to write about the naturalness of love beyond traditional heteronormative boundaries. They are his first intense reflections on the attraction he felt for other men. They also present a new chapter in literary and social history. In these poems, Whitman attempts to establish a definition of same-sex love decades before the word homosexual is actually used. He dreams of a supportive community of lovers more than 100 years before today's LGBTQ movement started. And our book, Live Oak with Moss, presents Whitman's cluster of secret same-sex love poems to the general public for the first time. It definitively queers the man known as Walt Whitman, an American, one of the roughs, a cosmos. So why haven't you been introduced to Live Oak with Moss before? And maybe you didn't even know that Whitman was gay or queer? It's Whitman's own fault as well as the fault of those who have silenced discussions of his sexuality from his time to our own. Whitman's coming of age as a poet is a long story, still full of dark patches. He was the second of eight children, born to barely literate, financially unstable parents. He was a grammar school dropout who learned to love language while setting type for Brooklyn's booming print industry. And through his 20s and his early 30s, he was really better known as a newspaper editor, uh, notably of the Brooklyn Daily Eagle from 1846 to 48. When he was fired from the Eagle for his increasingly radical political stance, he spent three important months in New Orleans. That was the only place he could have seen live oak trees during this time, before returning to New York and eventually publishing the first two editions of Leaves of Grass in 1855 and 56. So these were his first books of poetry, printed without publishers and financed by his own funds. He was disappointed by their reception, but kept writing poetry through the late 1850s, and that's the point when he began actively seeking love on the streets of New York. Um, there we go. The, the bigness, or loneliness, and romantic potential of his Manhattan is captured by the photographer Victor Provost, a French photographer who left Paris for New York in 1848 and was captivated by the city scale. Just as Whitman was writing his first love poems to New York City, Provost was celebrating it through the first extensive photo series of its vistas and buildings. 
And you can see here Brian's repurposing of some of Prevost's big calotypes. These are wax paper negatives, all produced during the 1850s. Truly extraordinary images of the city. Also during this time, a favorite hangout for Whitman was called was Fox Cellar Saloon. Oops, skipped one, sorry. Near the corner of Bleecker and Broadway, the building still stands. Foss was an underground bar and the birthplace of American Bohemia, a permissive space with a diverse clientele of laborers as well as journalists, act artists, and actors. Whitman claimed that he was going almost every night through the late 1850s and early 1860s. And here you see uh, an image produced much after Whitman actually uh, went to Foss. And this is Walt leaning back on his chair and greeting William Dean Howells within the bar. The bar actually looked much more working class uh, than is depicted here. On scene also in this place was the Fred Gray Society, which may well have been America's first gay men's club. And so was Fred Vaughn, an Irish stagecoach driver, 20 years Walt's junior, who may have been his first boyfriend. And I'm going to show you an image here of Whitman at this time. Not so well known. We tend to know his photographs more than his paintings. This, this was painted by his friend Charles Hine around 1860, and it depicts some of the after effects of hanging out at Fox's uh, cellar saloon. Those rosy cheeks kind of give him away. Fox had imported the recipe for lager, and New York was a stout and ale drinking town before this. So they, New Yorkers fell head over heels in love with a fresh drink lager. And the other thing you probably can't see from your seat is that Hine depicted the chest hair fluffing out of um, Whitman's shirt there, which I think is, is pretty funny. Um, the, the, the image also shows how Whitman bridged the gap between worker and artist, physical and intellectual, because those cheeks could also be sunburnt, right? Um, his hat brim would have sat where you see his very white forehead. And unlike any aristocrat getting his portrait done, Whitman didn't mind being shown with a sunburn, right? And meanwhile, he's still sporting this Byronial collar, right? Influenced by the poet Lord Byron. So Whitman never published the Live Oak with Moss poems as he had written them in this little notebook that he decided to gather up in the late 1850s. Never mentioned these poems to his closest friends. And it was only in the 1950s when a scholar named Fredson Bowers discovered these manuscripts at the University of Virginia in one of the libraries, and he published an article about Live Oak with Moss in a journal called Studies in Bibliography. I'm sure you all read that all the time, but maybe you can understand why some of the reasons why these poems have stayed very, very um, quiet and, and really un, undiscovered uh, until now. Um, and really, it was until in the 1990s, at the dawn of the LGBTQ movement, that we actually got more attention to the poems. Even now, over 160 years after Whitman conceived Live Book with Moss, this revolutionary, extraordinarily beautiful, and passionate cluster of poems remains largely unknown to the general public. And here I'm showing you some of the drafts that Whitman had of these poems. Um, we have reassembled the little Live Oak with Moss notebook that Whitman had worked on and then took apart. In the back of the Live Oak with Moss book, we've actually put them together life-size so that you can page through uh, Whitman's, Whitman's uh, work. There's another piece there. And before I let you go, I just want to entice you a little bit about why we really fell in love with these poems. Uh, this is Live Oak with Moss 8, which has meant a lot to me and to my students. And I'd like to introduce you to it. Hours continually long, sore and heavy-hearted. Hours of the dusk when I withdraw to a lonesome and unfrequented spot, seating myself, leaning my face in my hands. Hours sleepless deep in the night, when I go forth, speeding swiftly the country roads or through the city streets or pacing miles and miles, 
stifling, plaintive cries. <coughs> Hours discouraged, distracted. For he, the one I cannot content myself without, soon I saw him content himself without me. Hours when I am forgotten, oh, weeks and months are passing, but I believe I am never to forget. Sullen and suffering hours. I am ashamed, but it is useless. I am what I am. Hours of my torment. I wonder if other men ever have the like. Out of the like feelings. Is there even one other like me? Distracted, his friend, his lover, lost to him? Is he too as I am now? Does he still rise in the morning, dejected, thinking who is lost to him? And at night, awaking, think who is lost? Does he too harbor his friendship, silent and endless? Harbor his anguish and passion? Does some stray reminder or the casual mention of a name bring the fit back upon him, taciturn and depressed? <coughs> Does he see himself reflected in me? In these hours, does he see the face of his hours reflected? So the poem is a, a short one for Whitman. I'm sure you were expecting a longer poem if you know some of myself. This is a 12 line poem, and it bears a remarkable resemblance to a sonnet. Um, a sonnet is typically 14 lines. But this has many of the elements that you would think of with uh, a sonnet. For instance, the first half of the poem, you might have noticed the word hours repeating. And when you say it, or when you hear it, the word drags out, right? It reminds you of that time going very, very slowly. But also you hear O-U-R-S, hours, the thing that actually has been lost. Now, a sonnet usually has a middle section called a volta, where there is a change in the feel of what is being discussed. And you have it here in a remarkable line, sullen and suffering hours. I am ashamed, but it is useless. I am what I am. That is Walt Whitman coming out in the middle of this poem uh, with a, a resignation, right? He uses the word ashamed, but at the same time, it's a decision to identify. And it launches him into a very different part of the poem where you have questions instead of those dragging hours. Right? There's <coughs> repeated questions about the lover and about his own character. And um, I guess most striking to me is that they, the poem ends with these questions, right? It is really an unresolved poem. And in fact, that couplet, those last two lines of a typical sonnet that make up the 14, they're missing here, right? The thing that usually resolves a poem is not, is not here. And in addition, um, the missing couplet reminds me of the missing couple. So uh, there's much to discover in these poems. Um, the Live Oak with Moss Cluster comprises what are probably the most personal and meaningful poems that Whitman ever wrote. And though the poems that you'll encounter in the book were previously seen by his eyes alone, their undeniable power to live beyond their moment, to touch other lives, has inspired Brian and me to write this book. The songs left to be sung, as Walt would say, are your own. Thank you so much.
Hello? Can you hear me? Yeah. We're getting this up. Oh, there we are. <laughs> All right. Um, well, first, I just want to say thank you again to you both for being here and uh, for sharing your work with us. Um, I, it, first, I guess it strikes me that um, this is a book about um, intimacy or intimacies um, a relationship or relationships and it also came out of a relationship between the two of you a collaborative sort of practice and I wonder if you could tell us a little bit about um, about how the book developed and the kind of conversations that happened uh, between both of you as you were working you want to start out talking about the puppet show sure <laughs> so I after Maurice uh, Sendak who I talked about in the introduction to the book uh, discussed this, told me about this book, uh, um, he told me about this sequence of poems, uh, he told me that he was interested in uh, possibly illustrating this sequence of poems himself. Uh, but he also said that he didn't think poetry should ever be illustrated uh, because uh, illustration is supposed to add something to, it, to, to words so that the words and the pictures together create something new. And he felt that poetry exists between the poem and the reader and an illustration would get in the middle. So even though he was thinking about possibly illustrating it, and he has illustrated po poems over the course of his career, um, he decided, either he decided not to or he hadn't, he passed away. But I was, became very uh, interested in this set of poems. And I had mentioned I had done a children's book about Walt Whitman, which I queered as much as I possibly could in a way that was appropriate for kids. That wasn't what the book was about, but I felt like it was part of my responsibility as a gay illustrator to bring that element in a way that was appropriate for children into the book. But these themes of sexuality and spirituality and the body and these things that were uh, so central to Whitman uh, stayed with me and I wanted to find a way to fully express them. So I did what anybody would do, is I made an erotic puppet show. And uh, I've been, I had been working a lot in 19th century, uh, in the style of 19th century toy theater, sort of tabletop toy theater. Uh, I love miniatures, I love working in miniatures, and I would make you know, like these miniature, these tiny miniature theaters. And so I performed this uh, little puppet show, which took place in a suitcase, in a three by five inch opening in the suitcase. I actually have a couple of clips. I'll, I'll show a, a few clips. Um, short. So, so here, it's gonna be a little hard to see, but it's me at a uh, red suitcase on a Victorian plant stand. And as the uh, cover opens, it, it reveals this little three by five inch opening I mentioned. And then below the, uh, hold on, let me just do that. Below the uh, video screen was the cellist, uh, Robert Ean, who uh, composed music to these poems. So he was singing the poems as they were, uh, as this show was going on. And the idea was that this video camera was trained on the three by five inch opening, making this private act simultaneously public, which in a way reflected what had happened to the poems themselves. So I, I was very intrigued also by the idea that the, these poems had a coming out story. They were kept private, they were secret, and then they came out. And so what I did was, throughout the, uh, the piece, as it went on, you'll, you'll recognize some of the images from the book that I shared with you came out of this uh, puppet show, which themselves came out of the poems themselves. So this, these images of the live oak tree and flames, but then other images that weren't specifically from the poems, like the snow, there's no mention of snow in the poems, but it's this idea that uh, you know there's loss and there's sadness and a room filling with snow seem to be the best way to uh, get that idea across. And then ultimately this ended with all of the uh, drawings in the puppet show disappearing, revealing me behind it, and my left hand seduced my right hand. And uh, my, my sleeves were buttoned up and I uh, stripped my, my uh, arm uh, seduced it, had a little uh, montage that didn't look dissimilar to the body sequence in the drawings. And then my hands went away and I unbuttoned my shirt and behind the opening was my chest and my hand on, on my body. And so as, as, um, 
as I had done this, uh, I performed it several times, and I think that's around the time uh, we had met, and you came and saw my dirty little erotic puppet show. <laughs> uh, Whitman is a populist poet. He is the opposite of elitist. He is meant to be enjoyed by everyone, and I really loved what Brian was doing, bringing complicated ideas to the public. So this book project became... I guess from my own perspective, a way to bring complex literary content, stuff that people are normally afraid to read by themselves, poetry, and trying to make poetry something that is approachable and enjoyable for everyone. So we started talking uh, probably about three years ago. Uh, I realized that Whitman's Bicentennial was coming and we needed to do some sort of tribute and especially because questions of his sexuality seem so prescient and now and timely. And it was also a huge year in New York for Stonewall. And I know that you all celebrated it here as well. So there couldn't have been a better choice than to, to take Live Oak and actually present it to the people. As I said before, I had been teaching Live Oak with Moss, but it was actually really hard to find these poems. So the idea was actually to bring these poems out from their closet, as you said, and give them a, a framework so that people could really just enjoy them, which happens to be Brian's incredibly beautiful imagery, which you get first. We talked a lot about what would come first in the book, and I feel like the illustrations really ease people into the reading of the poems in a beautiful way. You get introduced to a live oak tree first, visually, right, which is the way that we think, I think, first, and then you have the poems. If you want to dig deeper, you go into my essay, and then finally at the end is Whitman himself with the notebook. So it's really, um, and I, I guess John playing guitar today is part of the way that we've always thought about the book, which is off the grid, you know, this is not your normal book of poetry. This is a, a book that's trying to present it in a very fresh way and to make it something spirited and very Whitmanic. And on that note, I think I, I was so pleased to see those images of Whitman's book at the end of, mm -hmm. of this book and, and to be able to engage with his handwriting, with the warmness of the paper, with the, the marks of editing, with those pages as objects that he, um, and, and you described so beautifully how he, he bound them by hand and edited them and, and pieced them and moved them and the, the intimacy of that object was so clear in the way that you described it. And then, and, and now we have this really beautiful, handsome, um, you know, sort of gold edged book. <laughs> and, um, and I wonder what you think Whitman would make of this book that is so deeply related to the intimacy of his private little book um, that is now so available and, and public and, um, and gorgeous. You answer that one. <laughs> uh, we are now growing used to reading online. And online is easy. Um, but the book can be such a beautiful experience. And a book as an art object was the way that we were thinking about it. So it's not just the content, right? It is actually holding it and paging through it. Whitman himself helped print each edition of Leaves of Grass. It's very confusing, the history of Whitman and Leaves of Grass, but what you need to walk away with is he used that title, Leaves of Grass, for nine different books. And in each of those nine books, he included different poems, the books looked different, and he always had an artistic say in how the book was designed. And he usually, unless he was really sick when he was older, helped print the book. So for him, the actual physical book as object, as a material thing, was very important. And I, I think we're paying tribute to that here too. But we also just went crazy with what we really wanted to do as far as the book looks. Mm -hmm. That's your terrain, my friend. <laughs> uh, yes, I mean, we, we definitely were very focused on making this a beautiful object and very conscious of the fact that Whitman wrote a lot about how the book is him. The book is his body, uh, sort of like the Eucharist with Christ. It's like this is 
this is me. If you have my book in your pocket, you have me in your pocket. It is a direct physical relationship. Can I do a quote? Oh, please. Okay. Uh, sorry to interrupt. No, go. So, in So Long, Whitman writes, Camarado, this is no book. Who touches this touches a man. Oh, my. <laughs> is it night? Are we here together alone? It is I you hold and who holds you. I spring from the pages and into your arms. But this is a man who wrote, I am ashamed. You know, this is a man who wrote those words and then came out with the words, I am what, he said, I am ashamed, but it is useless. useless. But it is useless. I am what I am. The shame doesn't matter. And so I hope, I would hope that if Whitman were to wake up and look at this world where, you know, I'm married to my husband legally, and, you know, obviously we are in the middle of a huge fight, and the fight continues and will continue. Uh, nothing is settled, nothing is over. But the, the gains that have happened, even just in the 50 years since the Stonewall uh, uprising for the, for the uh, gay rights movement is just astonishing. So I would hope that uh, Whitman would see this at, at, from the point of view of the I am what I am and not the part of him that was that carried that shame which so many of us still carry with us. He did not think the world was ready for these poems. That's why he, you know, I discussed this in the afterword and we're hoping that the world is ready for them now. Brian, you mentioned Maurice Sendak, um, and, and you start the book with that conversation, and, and Maurice Sendak saying that poems don't need to be illustrated, and yet here we are. Um, uh, and your own practice as an artist and as a, a creative person is so rich with a variety of relationships between image and text. Mm -hmm. and, and you um, talk in the book about approaching these images not as illustrations, but as a lens or a framework. And I wonder if you could let us into your process just a little bit more, um, and sort of how you <laughs> developed this body of images, um, thinking about a framework or a lens. Mm -hmm. So when I was making The Invention of Hugo Cabret, it started off as a 95-page novella about a kid who meets George Melies and lives in a train station, mm -hmm. and there's an automaton. And as I was beginning to think about cinema and how cinema is a visual language and the, movie, the book has so much to do with the, with the history of film, and I was thinking a lot about uh, Where the Wild Things Are, uh, Maurice Sendak's uh, masterpiece, and thinking about uh, The Wild Rumpus, which I'm sure you, most of you can conjure in your minds right now. Um, that Wild Rumpus is the first sequence in Where the Wild Things Are, where there's no words, there's no white space. The, the pictures have taken over the entire book and you just move through the wild rumpus yourself for three full spreads, that's six pages, with no uh, words, no white space. And then you come out of the wild rumpus and Max is, realizes he's sad and misses home and is hungry and he leaves the place where the wild things are and goes back home. And so I began to think, is there a way to echo what happens in the cinema and what happens in the wild rumpus in a novel for older kids. And so I went back and I took out all of the description that I had written in my novella, all of the action, anything that I thought could be replaced by uh, images. But if there was dialogue or if there was a thought or a smell or a sound, uh, that had to stay because I wasn't going to use uh, thought bubbles or dialogue bubbles like a, a graphic novel or a comic book. I wanted the images to stand by themselves. And so I had a three-page description of the train station. And in order to get as much information that I had in the three pages of text, I needed uh, 25 drawings, which is 50 pages, because every drawing is two pages. And so it, it went from a 95-page uh, novella to a 550-page a, a uh, you know, doorstop. And, <laughs> and well, my, my editor, happily, was very supportive. But, but I learned so much about how, a, 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 how the interaction between words and pictures can be used to tell a story thematically, psychologically, narratively. And so then when I did Wonderstruck, uh, which is about two deaf children who run away to New York, I thought I can use the pictures now to parallel the way a deaf child experiences the world. Because if you're deaf, 
your uh, entire world is mostly visual. There's, there's touch, of course, and smell, but your language is visual. You, you sign language is a visual language. And so the, so the pictures became a parallel for the deaf experience. In the Marvels, the book I did after that, the pictures become memory in the, in the context of the story themselves. And so when Karen approached me with the idea of making a book for Whitman's uh, 200th anniversary, and we talked about the puppet show, which involved the physical, my physical self, you know, there was drawings, but there was my physical self, there was my body, there was a video, there was a cellist, there was a, you know, a, a music. Uh, there were a lot of elements that you're not gonna have in a book. You're gonna have pages and paper and uh, uh, images or words on those paper, on those papers. And so thinking about what I learned in the visual, in, the, in making those different types of visual narratives, I was thinking about how to do something that echoed uh, a more abstract poetic idea. And because Maurice had said not to illustrate poetry, uh, this book is, is sort of my answer to that, my response. And that's why the, the poems themselves do not have any pictures uh, directly with them. So the idea, as, as we were saying, was that the, the pictures give you a, a stepping stone, get our stepping stones. So a lot of times we might be afraid of poetry, we might feel like we're not gonna understand it, but by the time we get to the poems, we've seen a, an, a live oak tree, we've seen flames, we've seen cities, we've seen men, we've seen s images of sadness and loss. So as we come to those things, whether directly or abstractly in the poems, hopefully we'll feel like, oh, I already know this, I have a, a, a connection to this. And so that would sort of carry the reader through the uh, experience of reading the poems while still allowing Maurice's maxim that poems should not be illustrated to be respected while having a really, really serious work around uh, and trying to make it so that I can both, because the book is dedicated to Maurice. Like we, we dedicated the book to Maurice Sendak and his memory um, because it wouldn't exist without him. And so I think, uh, you know, everything that I learned from him, I made the invention of Hugo Cabret because of my friendship with Maurice. It came out of conversations with him. So, so being able to take all of that visual, uh, uh, all those visual ideas that I had sort of been planted by Maurice and letting them flower in this was a, a real thrill to experiment with. Karen, you um, propose a reading of this cluster that um, acknowledges its potential to be nonlinear, that we might not even think of it in terms of a monogamous relationship, but that um, uh, you, you, um, you sort of ask us to, our, to evolve in some ways our understanding of this cluster of poems to think about its inherent queerness. Um, and it strikes me that this way of thinking about the, the, the cluster of poems um, as not being um, simply sort of an arc of a relationship, but that it might swirl in on itself, it might involve many kinds of intimacies um, and many kinds of time, is a way of connecting us directly to Whitman's queerness itself, that it's about um, sort of the way Whitman lived, the way that he worked, and then asking us to read in that way, and that it functions in a queer way, it's not simply about mm. queerness. And I wonder if you could speak just a little bit more about um, um, you know, in, in light of Stonewall's 50th anniversary and, you know, all the, the sort of ways this book has been contextualized about these poems as Whitman's queerness. Hmm. Well, um, the ways that these poems have been read, there are 12 poems and previously they have been read as a sequence. In other words, they tell a story about a particular love that was one and then lost and sort of growing out of that. And I think just based on the fact that Whitman himself was quite experimental at the, at the time, and the afterward goes into this, uh, it would be really difficult to, to, to pin, it's always difficult to pin Whitman down, especially with, with an idea of a traditional monogamous relationship. So I try to show that these poems can be enjoyed out of sequence, that they are depictions of the many moods of what he called manly love. 
Uh, so they vary tremendously in tone. And I really love what you just said, you know, that, that the, the intent is to actually get us inside of his head thinking about uh, being off the grid, you know, not just the content being something that's challenging, but the way that we approach the poems is something that is challenging. And you have the book, actually, may I borrow that? I'll just give an example since you so kindly asked. There are, uh, the other wonderful thing about these poems is that they are shorter, right? So that you can actually get them uh, pretty quickly. But I'm just going to read one of the very short ones to you to open up this conversation a bit. Number six. What think you I have taken my pen to record? Not the battleship, perfect model, majestic, that I saw today arrive in the offing under full sail, nor the splendors of the past day, nor the splendors of the night that envelopes me, nor the glory and growth of the great city spread around me, but the two men I saw today on the pier, parting the parting of dear friends, the one to remain hung on the other's neck and passionately kissed him, while the one to depart tightly pressed the, the one to remain in his arms. So I find this, this subversive in so many ways. You know, first of all, the first line sounds like something the traditional idea of Whitman would write a poem about, the majestic ship leaving the port, right? The all-American poet. But instead, the, last, the final two lines really turn to the intimate. And I, I think throughout this, this cluster of poems, Whitman is, is really struggling between those two roles he saw for himself as, a, as America's poet but also a poet of, of great intimacy. Um, and that particular catching of this couple on the pier, uh, an everyday beautiful moment that, that should be every day, should be as natural as a live oak with moss tree. Right? Um, I think uh, Whitman is really trying to turn queer into something quite normal, you know, quite natural. Um, not unnatural, as, as homosexuality was called at that time, but natural, and hence all of the, the natural images that, that Brian uses so well in the book. I'm sure there are questions in the audience. I think we have a microphone floating around somewhere in the back. If you have a question, just shoot that hand up. We'll get the mic to you. Thank you. Uh, I was just curious if you thought it might. Hello? Yeah, yeah, we can hear. All right. um, uh, thank you very much. Um, I was just curious if you thought it might be an unfair and unsympathetic reading of the, the homonym hours in eight is to not, I mean, of course, it to some extent refers to the hours that was lost, but what about the hours that is coming to fruition? with you reading the poem, or you reading Whitman, as you talked about mm -hmm. earlier in the talk. Like, the last two stanzas missing from the sonic, if you will, is the relationship that is now developing between the reader and Whitman. Um, mm -hmm. Because, as you also mentioned in your talk, he didn't feel the world was ready for this, so is that too hopeful of a reading of this? Like, was he trying to bring this into normalcy with the hours created between the reader and him, or do you think that's a little bit too hopeful given the necessity to some extent of being closeted during his time? Mm. Wow, that's really beautiful. Thank you for that. Uh, uh, in the afterword, I include a transcription of a note that he wrote on the back of one of the Live Oak with Moss poems, where he's really contemplating, he says he's writing poems or sonnets fit to be perused upon the arrival of death. Um, and he starts really musing, I think, on whether or not he can release these poems. So uh, back to your question about, is it too optimistic to see Whitman reaching out to the reader? I, I don't think so, but I, I think probably Whitman um, had his own wrestle with that. Um, and decided 
he didn't, right? So he, he actually decided not to include these poems, you know, as they were uh, to the reader. But I do think that today, this is one of the reasons that we wanted to bring this book out. There, there is that message of hope that Whitman projects from deep in the darkness of the late 1850s about intimacy shared between men, between the reader and the, the writer, the illustrator. Um, it's one of these, the reasons that the poems speak to me so strongly. I think you're right. He, he is reaching out to the reader. Can I just read the first couple of lines again with that in mind? Mm. <laughs> <laughs> do you want me to do it? No, I think, because I think, you know, what I was talking about in terms of what Maurice said about the relationship between a poem and the reader, that's what you're touching on. That's, you know, that's what you're saying. That, that what Karen brought up with the O-U-R-S is Whitman and us. Hmm. Hours continuing long, sore and heavy hearted, hours of the dusk when I withdraw to a lonesome and unfrequented spot, seating myself, leaning my face in my hands, hours sleepless deep in the night when I go forth, speeding swiftly the country roads or through the city streets, or pacing miles and miles, stifling plaintive cries, hours discouraged, distracted, for he, the one I cannot content myself without, soon I saw him content himself without me. I'd say yes. That's yeah, I mean, if I may, I think like, the, the, end, the end is quite sad and it sounds quite lonely, but he can't possibly really believe he's alone, right? As he seems to point towards. Like he had the bar that we talked about at the beginning, and again, while he couldn't be open, mm. Mm. I think. Right, but it's also easy to feel very lonely in a crowd. Yes, yeah. Um, I think he exacerbates it. Yeah, 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 yeah. Thank you so much. That's a really beautiful, um, beautiful thought. Hi there. Hi. Um, thank you guys so much for being here. Um, you talk a little bit about how Whitman didn't feel like it was time yet to release these poems, and you hope that now is the time and that the world is ready for this. Um, you guys have bring evidence of the world not being ready for this. I mean, I know that there's always going to be outliers, but have you found an overwhelmingly homophobic response, or do you have any particular interactions that you would like to talk about with that? Hmm. I mean, we all are very aware of you know, what's going on in the world right now, and that, you know, even in places that are very liberal, in, in New York City, there are, you know, coming out can still be really hard. We live in a world where children can come out, and where children don't, there are children who don't know what it's like to come out. There are children who don't know what it's like to be in a family that, that rejects them, because their community is able to support them, trans kids, like it's, it's like, there are stories that are just so unthinkable to someone who is, you know, older than a child right now. <laughs> and so, so the fact that that exists is extraordinary, but their next door neighbor could have a kid who is terrified of coming out because they feel like they might lose their family, they might lose their friends, they might lose their community. So, so we're living in this very, you know, in so many ways in such a bifurcated time. Um, but the fact that that even exists at all in so many places is, uh, I think, something to be very, very grateful for and to continue fighting for. In terms of the direct response to this book, I've only had positive responses. I've, I've had very, you know, very good conversations and that it's, it's engendered um, people to share personal things with me that I find very moving and I appreciate. So it's been a very positive experience for me. Mm -hmm. Yeah, it's, it's a great question, but we have not yet encountered uh, homophobia. One of the next stops for this book is Abu Dhabi, uh, which will be interesting, bringing the book to a Muslim country. So we'll see if, my, if the response is different after that. But um, so far, the reception has been really warm. Thank you. Politics that you mentioned them earlier, and I was wondering if his 
queerness had an impact on his political views or like vice versa? Like, yeah, that's about it. <laughs> I think that you know Whitman was always bucking the system, and maybe that comes with, from the angle from being queer, right? He, he, uh, uh, for instance, uh, most people know about his Civil War uh, service, but what Whitman did is um, he was too old to fight during the Civil War, so instead of fighting, he volunteered and took care of soldiers for three and a half years. Um, writing letters to their loved ones, suturing wounds, and so forth, um, seeing the war from a whole different standpoint. So there is a history in the United States of uh, war poetry that is all about the glory of war and being out there on the battlefield. Whitman totally changes the idea of what war poetry is about and writes about it from inside the tents. Uh, if you want to read a really moving war poem, in my opinion, you read The Wound Dresser, which was actually set to music by the composer Robert Adams, and it is a graphic view of, uh, from a nurse's point of view, of taking care of soldiers who are dying in the war. So to me, that's very typical of Whitman looking from a, an alternate perspective at things. And I guess... You know, it's, it's, it's a, you're asking a great question that I don't have a clear answer to because he didn't identify, right? He, he was kind of floating around at a time when there was still a lot of same-sex affection that was openly displayed. Um, as I mentioned, the word homosexual, it's, it's actually invented in Germany in 1869, and it's only the late 19th century where Americans really start using that word. So, so Whitman didn't have a vocabulary for what he felt like, and I feel like that allowed for an enormous amount of fluidity with Whitman. Um, I think we're still catching up in many ways to the ways he thought about um, gender and sexuality beyond boundaries. And yes, I think in my heart, I think that influenced his politics as well. I, I was just wondering if you've made any uh, editorial changes from the um, Bowers edition that you did here that we see in the Norman Anthology. Were there, did you make changes into the lines? I teach these poems. I'm kind of curious if there are wordy changes or line changes that, that I'd like to know about. Thank you. That's a really great question because I newly edited the poems for this collection. And what I did is most times that you see those poems being printed, all of the editorial marks that Whitman has as you page through those manuscripts, in all pencil, pen, different types of pen, they're all integrated into what people have used as the base of these poems. But what I do is I take the poems back to their last intact form before he started changing the poems into other poems. You know, but what he did with the this this notebook is he used it as a basis for working on the Calamus poems, which he actually did publish in 1860. So those manuscripts, like you saw up here and that are in the book, they show a lot of changes in process. And I wanted to take the poems back to the point where Live Oak with Moss was what he was thinking about before he started changing them into the Calamus poems. So yes, these poems are differently edited. They read differently. And I have a section in the afterword where I talk about the changes because Whitman was a really great poet of first inspiration. Uh, people who are familiar with Whitman know that when he made changes through time, he often made it for a conservative, more conservative change. You know, he, he takes out some of the nastiest, juiciest bits of sexuality uh, by the time you get to the deathbed edition of Leaves of Grass. So I wanted to get that freshness of the Live Oak with Moss poems as they were directly invented and before he started playing with them. I think of that line, uh, they made me think of manly love from, I saw in Louisiana Live Oak Road, it was changed in the in the Norton, in the Norton edition and in, and in your edition as well. 
That is right. Manly and love is a later word that he uses. So my edition doesn't use that word. Yeah. He that was a, a later fabrication of his, but obviously he was really wrestling with the idea before that. Oh, it was later rather than earlier. Manly love was a, a, a later change. Gotcha. Thank, Thank you. you. The, one of the things that fascinates me about the 19th century is the idea that manly love was not associated in any way publicly with homosexuality. It was associated with the idea that men, male friendship, because it's between two men and men are better than women, manly love is higher in a way than romantic love between a man and a woman because it involves two men. That, it, there's nothing sexual about that. And so in the public sort of idea of what manly love is, it's called um, uh, uh, adhesiveness. adhesiveness. And it was you know, part of the bumps on the head. You can see how much adhesiveness you had. And so the Calamus poems, which are all now read as deeply queer, because, you know, they are, uh, <laughs> at the time... But they were not. But yeah, at the time they weren't. Right. And there was another section of poems called Children of Adam, which celebrate heterosexual love and women's bodies and how women's bodies and men's bodies are equal and both, both are miracles and men and women are equal and sex between men and women is, you know, powerful and... Uh, procreative, and those were the ones that people were horrified by and that got him in trouble and got him censored. Mm -hmm. In fact, one of the poems that was heavily censored is called The Dalliance of the Eagles, which is basically a poem about two eagles kind of having sex. But I guess the idea of using the national symbol that way <laughs> just irritated people so much. Those were the poems that everybody thought had to get mixed out of. <laughs> Nobody saw like the Calamus poems as as upsetting. Yet, yeah. So. Yeah, men used to walk down the street. You know, men used to walk down the street holding hands. They still do in Arab countries. Like this, it's not associated with homosexuality. And you've probably seen 19th century photographs of men with their arms around each other in photo studios, and there's a 100% chance a lot of those guys are gay, and that they were couples. But a lot of them probably weren't, and were just friends, and it was just how men, you know, men slept in the same bed together. It seemed really good to be gay at the time, actually. <laughs> <laughs> in certain ways. <laughs> uh, any other questions? Any other questions? Well, if not, um, Brian and Karen are going to sign books uh, afterwards. I really encourage all of you not to leave without this absolutely glorious volume, uh, Live Oak with Moss. Thank you so much uh, for being here tonight. And thank Amy Benson so much for bringing this event to life.